Well, hello everyone. It is about 11.15 on Friday night. Um, if I am loopier than normal, you'll have to forgive me. I am sitting here on my couch in my living room. So, welcome to my home. Welcome to my living room. Uh, we're going to have class from here uh, tonight. And before we jump into the second half of chapter 6, which is on operant conditioning, I just want us all to look at the study guide for exam 2. Just a reminder that the exam is on Tuesday. I uh, just can't state that enough. I don't want anyone to be surprised by this exam. Remember to bring your ID, uh, number two pencil, and the proper Scantron. And really, this study guide is completely comprehensive. Uh, if you know this study guide backwards and forwards, not just definitions, but being able to apply the material and coming up with examples and really understand it and are able to, to teach it to someone else, uh, you will be able to dominate this exam. Um, I did want to highlight this one sentence right here. I said that there's only two straight reading questions. One is the bonus question, and the other one is on these brain imaging and recording techniques. You really only need to know one or two sentences about each one of those recording or brain imaging techniques. Do not spend a ton of time on that. Just understand, basically, how do they record brain activity. Um, in the lecture that I'm about to teach, I was going to talk about Bandura's Bobo doll experiments, but because this is probably so incredibly boring for you, um, just to listen to my voice and look at, at my screen, I am going to have you read uh, the basic findings of these Bobo doll experiments. So really it's adding, I guess, a third question, not just these two straight reading questions. So make sure you just read Albert Bandura's Bobo Doll Experiments. They're interesting, really good videos of them online, and the book does a, a really good job of explaining what these experiments did. I wish I could talk about it, wish we could discuss it more. Um, it gets into the whole violence and video game issue uh, that, that we deal with in today's society. But really, um, this is the exam. So know this stuff backwards and forwards and uh, you really will do uh, excellent on the exam. So today we're going to talk about operant conditioning. We've talked about classical conditioning in the last lecture, and now I just want you to get a pop culture example of operant conditioning. Are you finished? Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, sorry, Sheldon, I almost sat in your spot. Did you? I didn't notice. Have a chocolate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're here a lot now. Am I talking too much? I'm sorry. Zip. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chocolate? Yes, please. Oh. Hey, Kim. Yeah, I... You know what? Hold on. Let me take this in the hall. Okay. I know what you're doing. Really? Yes. You're using chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Chocolate? No, I don't know. You can watch more of that clip if you'd like. Um, but whereas classical conditioning, we talked about the pairing of two stimuli together, uh, here, operant conditioning is speaking about learning that is controlled by the consequences of the organism's behavior. The organism meaning the human, the animal, um, whatever it may be. But this is learning that is influenced by what comes after the behavior. If something favorable happens after the behavior, that behavior is likely to increase. If something unfavorable happens after the behavior, 
that behavior is likely to decrease. So the, simply the organism's behavior or your behavior is shaped by what comes after it. Again, this is from the, the behaviorist school of thought. You may not necessarily agree, but there is a lot of just empirical support for operant conditioning. So again, the human's behavior, animal's behavior is shaped by what comes after it. So there's the picture of the good dog there. Think about any of you who might have a pet. Um, what do you do when, the, when that, that dog or that cat goes to the bathroom outside? Um, do you give the dog a treat? Do you reinforce really that, that target behavior? And you'll also hear operant conditioning referred to as instrumental conditioning. All right, so what are the terms for operant conditioning? And these are similar to classical conditioning, and I'm going to give you a number of problems on the test, and you have to be able to identify the type of operant conditioning that's going on in that example. So be able to speak this terminology in this language just like you should be able to speak about the UCS, UCR, CS, and CR. So for any one of these problems, the first thing we're going to have to decide is, is what's going on, reinforcement or punishment? Okay, is what's going on in the problem, in the example, reinforcement or punishment? So if you turn your attention to reinforcement, a reinforcement is any outcome that strengthens the probability of a response. Okay, this is anything that comes after the behavior, anything that comes after the response that strengthens that behavior or strengthens the probability of that behavior. So reinforcement can be positive or negative. Punishment is any outcome that weakens the probability of response. So anything that comes after the behavior that decreases or weakens the probability of that behavior or response. It can also be positive or negative. One thing I want you to get out of your heads right now, curse this filthy habit uh, if, if this is something you struggle with. A lot of people think positive means good and negative means bad. Positive does not mean good or negative, and negative does not mean bad in operant conditioning. Positive simply means, uh, whether it's reinforcement or punishment, we are administering a stimulus. Okay, positive means we are administering, giving a stimulus. Whereas negative means we are taking away a stimulus. So hear me on this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You have to decide in all these problems, first, whether reinforcement or punishment is going on, and then whether it's positive or negative. And by positive or negative, I don't mean happy or sad, good or bad. I mean, are we administering a stimulus to reinforce it? Are we taking away a stimulus to reinforce the behavior? Are we administering a stimulus to punish the behavior? Are we taking away a stimulus to punish the behavior? So you can see there's always going to be four choices here. Positive and negative reinforcement, positive and negative punishment. I cannot be repetitive enough because this is something that students uh, miss right up there with classical conditioning. So we'll just do a number of examples. I've posted uh, under the course materials tab in Blackboard in the miscellaneous folder some operant conditioning examples. So I would suggest just to pause this lecture right now and to download those operant conditioning examples. So we're going to move forward right now and do these examples together. But again, I think you should try to do these on your own before you listen to these examples. That will really help you. Uh, called the testing effect, and it just increases and enhances memory. All right, so this is how I would set these out. When we have an operant conditioning example or question on the test, I would write out reinforcement, punishment, negative, positive. And let's first look at, at whether a behavior is um, being strengthened or weakened? Are we inc trying to increase a target behavior or are we trying to decrease a target behavior? So scolding by a pet, scolding by a pet owner, uh, reducing a dog's habit of chewing on shoes. 
So scolding by a pet owner, reducing a dog's habit of chewing on shoes. So what's the target behavior? Are we trying to increase or decrease a target behavior? Well, clearly in this one we're trying to reduce the dog's habit of chewing on shoes. So I would circle punishment. This is punishment. Okay, and what makes it punishment is this idea that behavior is decreasing. Okay, what makes it either negative or positive now is we have to say is a stimulus being administered or something being removed or taken away. This is a little bit tricky, um, but yelling or scolding or spanking, uh, these are all administering a stimulus. So you're, you are administering a stimulus by yelling or by spanking. So in this example, we're talking about positive punishment. So this isn't positive meaning happy or good. It just means we are reducing the dog's habit of chewing on shoes. That's punishment. And we're doing it by administering or giving a stimulus, which in this case is the pet owner's voice, the yelling uh, at the dog. So confiscating a favorite toy, stopping a child from throwing future tantrums. Okay, so what is the target behavior here? Target behavior is the tantrums. Are we trying to reduce? Are we trying to increase the frequency of these tantrums? Well, clearly here we're, we are stopping the child, and trying to decrease the future tantrums. So in this example, we say that it's punishment. Uh, and are we administering or taking away a stimulus? Here, clearly, we're confiscating or taking away a favorite toy. So here, it's negative punishment. So in both of these examples, we're, doing the, we're, we're wanting the exact same thing to happen. We're wanting the behavior to decrease. We're going to punish that behavior. Will we do it by taking away or by adding? In this first example, we're adding a stimulus. In this example, we're taking away a stimulus. These are really clearly written. We'll have some down here that maybe is not that are not quite as clear, but here, um, again, really clearly written. And we're we're trying to decrease the behavior by taking away a toy. Okay, um, moving forward, giving a gold star in homework, resulting in a student studying more. Are we trying to increase or decrease the target behavior? First of all, in these problems, identify what is the target behavior. Well, the target behavior here is studying, right? We want the students to study more. So we are reinforcing that behavior. Are we giving or and administering a stimulus, or are we removing or taking away a stimulus? And here, clearly, we are giving a gold star, so it's positive reinforcement. Next example, a professor has a policy of exempting students from the final exam. So removing the final exam, if they maintain perfect attendance during the quarter, the student's attendance increases dramatically. This one might be a little bit trickier for most people. But first, identify what is the target behavior in this example. Are we trying to increase or decrease something? Yes, yeah, since we are trying to increase attendance. So a professor here is trying to increase the attendance of his or her students. So for here, it's reinforcement. Okay, is something being added, administered, or is it being removed and taken away to reinforce the attendance? If you said it's being removed or taken away, you would be correct. So this is negative reinforcement. People don't think of negative reinforcement because they think of reinforcement as, as only being, being good. And to some extent, that's correct. Reinforcement is good and that it increases a behavior. Positive or negative, again, does not mean good or bad or happy or sad. So it's negative because we're removing an exam to increase attendance. Frequency in which an employee is late for work decreases as a result of losing their right to listen to music while he or she works. So the frequency in which an employee is late for work decreases. 
what is the target behavior here? What is the boss or we as the supervisor, you and me as a supervisor, um, what are we trying to do, increase or decrease the behavior? Yes, we are trying to decrease the, the employee being late. So we're trying to punish that behavior. And are we doing that by taking away a privilege or by administering or giving a privilege? And so the language in this example says that we are, uh, the employee is going to lose the right to listen to music while he or she works. So that is negative punishment. Much like up here, which is the other example of negative punishment. Okay, I hope we're all on the same page here. And, and a lot of this does depend on the wording. So if you need some clarification during the exam, raise your hand, ask. Because um, we could maybe say the frequency in which an employee is on time increases as a result of and then you fill in the blank. Um, if the frequency is increasing, obviously it's going to be a form of reinforcement. But here we're talking about uh, the rate at which they're late for work decreases. Okay, static. Static on the phone subsides when you stand in a specific spot in your room, causing you to stand there more. Okay, is there a behavior that has been increased or decreased in this example? Yes, you stand in that spot more. So the standing behavior is being reinforced. Okay, and the static, the stimulus here, is being removed to reinforce that behavior, right? The static on the phone subsides, which means decreases. The static is removed, taken away. So it is negative reinforcement. Static on the phone being taken away when you stand in, the, in a specific spot in your room and it causes you to stand there more. So <laughs> to me this is really interesting, super fascinating that Really, in, in many different facets in society, we use reinforcement. Reinforcement and punishment is used uh, all the time in the school system. Okay, is used um, whether it's to, to give a gold star or candy for a student that does well, um, to, to give a good job or a pat on the back to a student who does well. Um, when you're trying to teach your dog uh, how to go to the bathroom outside, when you're trying to train a child um, to go to the bathroom in the toilet, um, and not all over the floor, you're using reinforcement. When you're trying to decrease a child's behavior, maybe um, some bad behavior, you might punish them uh, by grounding them, taking away privileges, and things, uh, things of that nature. Okay, so before we get into the schedule of re uh, schedules of reinforcement, another thing that is on the exam that I don't have a slide for, that I want you to make sure and write down, is that punishment. What, what does the research say about punishment? Well, and I'm not making a political or religious statement here. Um, I, was, I was spanked and punished growing up. Um, and so it's for you to decide what you think is wrong or right. But in terms of what research shows, uh, proponents of, of, or really, you know, people, opponents, opponents, People against spanking say that punishment in general uh, causes an increase in anxiety, um, which will actually interfere with the learning process. And so they won't actually learn something when they're being punished. They'll just uh, be anxious. Um, opponents of punishment also say that punishment uh, increases subversive behavior. Okay, punishment increases subversive behavior so that it would encourage the child to still do the act, um, but to do it in, more in, a, in a sneakier way to avoid being caught. Um, but there is research supporting both sides. 
Research generally shows that punishment is most effective when it is delivered right after the target behavior. That's the takeaway message. That's what you need to know for the test is that punishment is most effective if research supports this when the punishment is administered or delivered right after that target behavior that we're trying to punish. So think about this. If your dog goes to the bathroom inside and three weeks later you punish the dog for going to the bathroom inside, and now it seems ludicrous, but clearly they're going to have no idea why you're punishing them. Same thing for a child. If you bring something up for a young child, maybe something six hours later that they did in the morning and you bring it up at dinner for, for a younger child, they're not going to understand what's going on. So punishment, if, if you choose to use punishment, and I, I'm not necessarily an opponent of it by any means, it needs to be um, right after the behavior. And secondly, it needs to be in, uh, in addition to a lesson or, or teaching, right? Make a clear statement of, of what the child or what the animal did wrong. Well, if you could speak to the animal and they could speak English, then, then that would make sense. But let's think about with the child example. Um, are you going to deliver it right after it happens? And will you teach? Will you tell them what they did wrong, why it's wrong, and, and what you expect from them moving forward? So that is what you need to know about punishment. There's a lot of controversy around it, but there is research supporting kind of both sides of that issue. Okay. And there are also four major schedules of reinforcement. And by schedule of reinforcement, I just mean um, when we choose to reinforce behavior. Okay. By schedules of reinforcement, I just mean when we choose to reinforce behavior. Okay. So in these four schedules vary along two dimensions. Okay, and they first vary along the consistency of administering the reinforcement. The consistency of administering the reinforcement. So the first thing is, is this reinforcement fixed or variable? Fixed, right next to fixed, regular or consistent. Something that's fixed is every blank number of responses or every uh, five minutes or whatever it might be. Fixed is consistent and regular. Variable, just as it sounds, is inconsistent. It's unpredictable. Okay, so we don't know exactly when the reinforcement is coming. The person being reinforced does not know when the reinforcement is coming. And actually, there's benefits to both, so one is not necessarily better than the other. So first, we'll have to decide, is this fixed or is it variable? And then we'll have to decide on the basis of administering the reinforcement. Do we reinforce it based on interval? And write down next to interval time or duration. Interval is just talking about time or duration. And write, by, write down next to ratio or, or in your notes. Uh, the number of responses. The number of responses. So as you can see, something can be fixed interval, fixed ratio, variable interval, variable ratio. Okay, and we're going to go and look at each of these individually on the next slide. So fixed ratio provides reinforcement after a regular or consistent number of responses. Okay, so if I owned a widget factory, I'm not exactly sure what a widget is, but if I owned a widget factory and I paid you every 20 widgets that you created, I paid you, I would be using a fixed ratio of payment. It's fixed because it is consistent, it's regular, it's ratio because it's number of responses. So circle regular for fixed, number for ratio. And again, that's if I gave you a payment every 20 times, every 20 widgets that you created. Fixed interval provides reinforcement for producing the response at least once, after or during, after or during a specified amount of time has passed. 
that's the book definition. But a really clear example, I don't know if any of you guys have jobs right now where you're paid by a bi-weekly or weekly or monthly paycheck. Uh, your, your boss there, your company is using fixed interval method of payment. It's fixed because it's consistent, it's regular, it's interval because it's um, an amount of time. So every two weeks you receive a paycheck, that would be the fixed interval schedule of reinforcement. Variable ratio is the response is reinforced after an unpredictable number of responses. Okay, so now we're inconsistent, unpredictable, and irregular. And it's ratio, so it's number of responses. Great example of this is slot machines. Um, excuse me, that's my phone dropping onto the floor. A, a great example of this um, is uh, the slot machines at a casino. Okay, so the response is reinforced based on a certain number of responses. But the problem is, it might be reinforced after uh, you pull the slot uh, after time six, and then not again until after pull 179, and then maybe not reinforced again until after pull 325, and then 364, 390, and so on. You get the point that... Um, it is based on number of responses, but the only person who knows when it's happening next, or the only object that knows when it's happening next, is the machine itself. Okay, so it is unpredictable, um, and it's based on a number of responses that you don't know, obviously. And so, variable ratio is why slot machines are so uh, addicting, why gambling is so addicting. Um, and it, so it provides the strongest, kind of the strongest response of the four schedules of reinforcement. It usually creates the strongest response. It almost addicts uh, the, the person in that behavior, not knowing when the next reinforcement is going to come. Variable interval, the response is reinforced after an unpredictable amount of time has passed. Variable, meaning unpredictable, inconsistent, irregular. Interval, speaking of an amount of time. So this is really smart occasionally for bosses to operate on the variable interval schedule in terms of when they drop in on their employees. So can you think about a boss that you have, whether it's in retail or at a restaurant, where you don't ever know when they're going to be over your shoulder, when they're going to be checking in on you? So what's effective about that is if you don't know when they're going to be checking in on you, you have to be on your game and working hard uh, consistently all the time. So it's interesting because variable is inconsistent, but it actually can produce some really consistent behavior because if you don't know when your boss is going to check in on you, you'll always try and be on your best behavior. So if you can somehow make it into a fixed interval schedule and you're trying to be a devious employee, if you and your other employees can figure out when the boss checks in, you'll know, hey, every, every day at 2 o'clock the boss comes in, this is when I'll start working better. That's not quite as effective for the boss, so that's why a boss might use the variable interval schedule. Some general findings about schedules of reinforcement. One, ratio schedules tend to yield higher rates of responding than do interval schedules. Okay, ratio schedules tend to yield higher rates of responding than do interval schedules. Think about this. Let's just Pretend you're a dog, okay? So let's think about what, what dog are you? I'm going to be a dachshund, because that's what I had throughout my childhood. So I'm going to be a dachshund. And I'm going to pretend I can understand and speak English. If I understand that I'm operating on a ratio schedule of reinforcement, let's say my owner is trying to get me to roll over, okay? And my owner told me, tells me, hey, every five times you roll over, I'm going to give you a treat. I'm going to respond more often because I know what? The more that I do, the more treats that I get. If I do 5, 10, 15, 20, as that number gets higher, I get more treats. Whereas if it's just an interval schedule, hey, you'll get a treat um, for doing a, a one rollover every five minutes. Okay, every five minutes you'll get a treat if you roll over once in that time span. I'm just going to roll over once. So if we're trying to get something like an animal or a person to respond at higher rates, in general, we want to use ratio schedules 
over interval schedules. Variable schedules tend to yield more consistent rates of responding than do fixed schedules. So this might seem like a little bit of a paradox. Remember this however you can, that variable schedules, even though variable schedules are inconsistent, they're going to yield more consistent rates in the individual. So this was the boss example a second ago. If the boss's behavior and time, uh, in, in, in when he or she shows up to check in on, on employees uh, is variable or inconsistent, it tends to yield more consistent rates of responding. This may not be the case for you, uh, but in general, in research, it's shown that variable schedules tend to yield more consistent rates of responding. Remember um, the, the slot machines here as well. And then variable ratio, if you put point one and two together on this slide, if ratio yields high rates and variable schedules tend to yield more consistent rates, well then variable ratio schedules usually yield the highest rates of responding uh, of all the schedules of reinforcement. And again, think slot machines there. So some applications uh, in animal training, um, shaping by successive approximations. You do need to know about shaping for the exam. Shaping by successive approximations just means instead of rewarding the end behavior, let's say the end behavior is getting the dog to take a doo-doo outside, um, instead of rewarding the end behavior, if we're having trouble doing that, we will start rewarding the dog for behaviors leading up to the target behavior. That's what I mean by successive approximations, behaviors leading up to that end target behavior. Um, I think probably even a better example is, is potty training with a child. Um, if you, Instead of just rewarding the child for going to the bathroom uh, in the toilet, you might first just reward the child for telling you that she has to go to the bathroom. Okay, reward your daughter for telling you that she has to go to the bathroom. And then maybe the next time you don't reward that, you reward her um, telling you and then walking towards the bathroom uh, even if she doesn't necessarily go in the toilet you reward her for making an effort to go towards the toilet and then so you shape that behavior and tell maybe you've rewarded three or four different behaviors leading up to that until you finally at the end reward uh, her actually going to the bathroom on the toilet herself uh, for instance my niece her name is Peyton, she's awesome, four years old, beautiful. Um, we can teach her how to spell her name by shaping. Okay, instead of just rewarding her by spelling the word Peyton, we might reward her for the P. And then reward her when she can do an E. And by reward, I just mean reinforce, saying good job. Um, you, you reward each one of those letters until she can spell her entire name. Now you can use uh, reinforcement to overcome procrastination. In fact, I highly recommend this. Um, spacing out your homework or, or saying, hey, I'm going to work for an hour or I'm going to work for 30 minutes. And after that 30 minute time span, um, I'm going to have some chocolate. Or maybe after that 30 minutes, I'm going to listen to a song. Or after that 30 minutes, I'm going to watch a YouTube video. That's positive reinforcement. If you can build some positive reinforcement uh, into your schedule, it'll make you more likely to, to, to really do that homework it's not to dread it. If you know that that homework is going to give you a reward afterwards, um, that's how positive reinforcement can help you overcome procrastination. Then superstitious behavior in athletes. Um, remember that the variable ratio uh, in terms of the schedules of reinforcement yields the highest rate of responding. Well, uh, think about baseball and, and hitters, someone who's at the plate in baseball something that uh, really we consider maybe three out of ten times, three hits at ten at-bats being a success. So this is variable. We don't know if we're going to get a hit at time one, maybe then at, at time four, or at bat number six, or eight, or twelve, or whatever. It's variable, and it's ratio. Um, so it yields this high rate of responding. Uh, so this is what reinforces superstitions. Confirmation bias, as we talked about, plays into that. Maybe you only remember the times where your superstition did work, but also if you keep pulling the slot, 
if you keep wearing those dirty underwear before a game or keep doing that silly superstition that you do, um, at some point it's going to pay off. And so you just keep doing it uh, until it pays off and it actually reinforces that superstition. So to compare classical and operant conditioning, brain imaging studies have actually demonstrated that these two forms of learning are associated with activations in different brain regions. So different brain regions light up in an fMRI. Different brain regions are activated when we engage in a classical conditioning task versus an operant conditioning task. Um, these two types of conditioning often interact, however, and it's known as the two-process two theory. And specifically, we talk a lot about the two-process theory of anxiety or the two-process theory of a phobia. So we need both classical and operant conditioning to explain the persistence uh, and the creation of anxiety disorders, to explain both the creation and the persistence of anxiety disorders. And so one anxiety disorder is a phobia. Uh, phobias are classified as anxiety disorders. And so we talked about in the last lecture, um, phobias are usually, not always, because um, remember, in terms of the cognitive model of learning, we can acquire a phobia uh, if, you, if you read through the cognitive model section, we can acquire a phobia just by watching someone else. So we, we, we can acquire a phobia by a seeing a fear in our mother or seeing a, a fear in our father. And so then we inherit or take on that fear. So it doesn't have to be classical and operant conditioning. But uh, oftentimes we need both of these to explain these, these phobias. So classical conditioning in, remember, something terrible happened to you as a child and you've come to pair... Uh, maybe uh, a dog attack uh, with dogs in general. You were attacked by a dog growing up, and so this phobia developed because you've associated dogs with attacks. That's classical conditioning. Well, the way that these uh, phobias are often maintained is if I see a dog walking at me on one side of the street, okay, and I continually avoid this. This happens all the time. When this dog is walking towards me on this side of the street, I cross over to the other side of the street. That removes, okay, it removes my anxiety. Okay, so we're actually taking away or removing a stimulus, so it's negative, and it's reinforcement. So it's actually going to increase my avoidance behavior. If every time I walk across the street, my anxiety is removed, it's taken away, what am I going to do? I'm going to continue to walk across the street and avoid facing the dog. So that is operant conditioning, negative reinforcement, maintaining the disorder. So we're going to want you to face that disorder, as we talked about last time, uh, or to face that, that thing that you're afraid of to overcome it. So just for review, uh, every time Billy talks back to his mom, he gets a spanking, uh, his mom is using, uh, and as you can see there, make sure you know why that is positive punishment. Okay, we're trying to decrease, and you see here's a really good example of where we didn't say uh, that any behavior decreases. But this one we'll just know uh, by common sense that we're here we're trying to decrease the talking back of the child to his mother. Okay, so we're decreasing that behavior, we're trying to, so we're punishing it. The spanking part is what is positive here, because we're administering a stimulus. Schedule reinforcement that leads to the largest rates of responding is the variable ratio schedule. If I've been repetitive, uh, hint, hint, it's because several of the things that I've said word for word in this lecture will be on the exam trying not to trick you on this section since you we didn't have this lecture in class. But again, that's it for this chapter. The last thing for the test is to remember to go through the study guide and go through the Bobo doll experiments for chapter 6. It's the only thing in chapter 6, I believe, I'm trying to think. Yeah, that's the only thing that I've not covered in these two lectures that's going to be on the exam. So have a great weekend. Email me with any questions that you have. I'm going to be in Louisville, Kentucky tomorrow. I will be back Sunday 
and I will get back to all of your emails uh, by Sunday.